Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome. We are so glad that you all are here this evening. We're going to get started here in just a moment. Want to give everyone a moment to find a seat if they're, if they're currently looking for one. So again, thank you for making your way out on this lovely rainy day for a truly wonderful opportunity. My name is Andrew Westover. I'm the Eleanor McDonald Storza Director of Education here at the High Museum of Art. And first, I'd like to thank our High Museum members who are in attendance. Your support is invaluable and fuels our mission. And if you are not yet a member of our museum or need to renew, please visit high.org at the end of this program. I'd also like to thank staff members Aaron Dougherty, Yadira Padilla, John Voorhees, and the full high team for their help making this program happen. Before the program begins, I'd like to take a moment to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Dr. Adrian Childs is a scholar, art historian, and curator. Childs' research and curatorial work is focused on the relationship between race and representation in European American fine and decorative arts, as well as the influence and achievements of African American artists in the 20th and 21st centuries. She co-curated the exhibition, The Color Anxiety, Race, Sex, and the Uncanny in Victorian Sculpture for the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds, England from November 22 to February of this year. Her book, Ornamental Blackness, The Black Figure in European Decorative Arts, is forthcoming from Yale University Press and explores how the decorative arts contribute to broader dialogues of black representation in 18th and 19th century European visual culture. Childs holds a BA in art history from Georgetown, an MBA from Howard, and an MA and PhD in art history from the University of Maryland. In 2022, Dr. Childs became the 17th Driscoll Prize recipient. Established by the High Museum of Art in 2005, the David C. Driscoll Prize in African American Art and Art History recognizes field-defining contributions to African American art by some of the leading scholars and artists from around the country. Named in honor of the late artist and scholar David C. Driscoll, this prize is the first in the country to recognize the importance of African American art. Acknowledging Driscoll's own extraordinary gifts as both a historian and an artist, the prize annually alternates between awarding a practicing US-based African-American artist and an art historian whose artistic practice or scholarly work makes an original and important contribution to the visual arts and study of African-American art. The recipient of the prize receives 50,000 US dollars in unrestricted funds to use toward furthering their research or artistic practice. This lecture, as I'm sure you know, is in conjunction with this prize, giving us an opportunity for our community to hear directly from these leading voices. I know too that we have many friends in the audience, both of the program, of the prize, and especially of tonight's speaker, Dr. Child. So without further ado, let's please welcome Dr. Adrian Childs. Thank you so much, everybody. This is so much fun. Um, I really appreciate y'all being here. Thank you, Andrew. And um, I would like to acknowledge uh, Rand Suffolk and his team here at The High. Everyone has made me feel welcome. And of course, I appreciate the honor of being the 2022 Driscoll Prize recipient. I want to congratulate Ebony Patterson on her well-deserved achievement. Uh, this is the last night that I wear the crown. <laughs> so you are all here to witness it. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Yadira Padilla for planning and coordinating this event and putting up with my diva travel requirements. <laughs> so my presentation today, um, Black Baroque, Contemporary Art and Spectacular Presence, is really embedded in my current <coughs> uh, curatorial project that we are calling Black Baroque Spectacular Presence in Contemporary Art. So there's a little switch up there. I say we because I'm working with my colleague and friend, 
Krista Clark, to produce an exhibition and publication on this theme. Much of my work over the last couple of decades has emerged from my investigations into race and representation into European and American art, with a particular focus on the black figure in historical European art, as well, as, well as the convergences and divergences and dialogues between black artists and the history of art. I think it's safe to say that in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, the critical mass of black artists developed a sustained push and pull relationship to the history of European art. While I was developing the exhibition Rifts and Relations that focused on black American artists and their relationship to modernism for the Phillips Collection in 2020, um, I encountered many you know, wonderful artists who engaged in the history of art, but not in modernism. So I was looking at artists who like, um, Hale Woodruff, who's familiar here, might have been looking at Picasso uh, and, and sort of getting nurtured from that relationship, or maybe Faith Ringgold later, who's taking Picasso on. So that's the kind of dialogue that was going on in Rifts and Relations. So there were so many artists that were so great that had to leave on the cutting room floor because they just didn't fit into this sort of repartee with modernism. So um, what were they doing? They were um, engaging and looking at earlier centuries, particularly in relationship to kingship or splendor uh, and European enslavement of Africans in the black Atlantic world. Um, so while I was lamenting and leaving these uh, artists on the cutting room floor, I saw another project formulating and bubbling up and that's what you see coming together here. Um, so, I, I felt like um, you know there were a lot of artists that were um, black diaspora artists, not just American artists or artists working in the United States. So that's why I invited Krista Clark to join me, who's an expert or uh, um, a curator of the black global, uh, global arts of Africa. And we began to put together this notion of black Baroque. We received a curatorial fellowship from the Clark Research Academic Program to develop this exhibition contract concept. And for that, we assembled a, a crackerjack team of scholars and curators and had a really fruitful convening. Many of the contributions of this group that we could put together have gone into my thinking uh, about what I'm presenting to you this evening. And we hope that this project will result in a publication and exhibition. Um, so tonight's presentation will be a bit about process and a kind of general overview of the concepts of the art um, and the artists who embody some of these essential concepts of our notion of black Baroque. So I'm not going to linger on a lot of the images. I um, want some of them, I mean, they'll have identifying um, titles and artists that you can look at and think about while I'm trying to explain some of these concepts. So what is Black Baroque? This is the only slide that uh, has text in it that I will read to you. <laughs> um, our notion of Black Baroque takes into account, <laughs> oh my God, uh, <laughs> past iterations of the Baroque as a period and an aesthetic style, but asserts different contexts for artists of Africa and its diaspora. We contend that there has been a Baroque turn in black, black diasporic art of the late 20th and 21st century. It can be thought of as a trend, a fashion, a visual language, a sustained practice that engages with both Baroque art history and Baroque sensibilities. But black Baroque moves beyond to accommodate the experience of new world slavery, the complex contours of the black Atlantic world, creative resistance, radical presence, and the celebration of the dynamic cultures that have developed in the wake. So that's the kind of general idea of what is this Black Baroque concept that, that we're working with. But first, in order to figure out what Black Baroque was, I had to figure out what Baroque meant, right? <laughs> and so oh, well, that's easy enough, you know, just read a few little things. Okay, so as I started to dig into this, what I thought would be a neat and simple definition of Baroque. I mean, I used to teach the survey of art history and you know, you come on now, Caravaggio, come on. But um, it's not as simple as that. And I was actually surprised and horrified <laughs> at how complex and how dynamic and fugitive and Baroque that the Baroque really is. <laughs> um, so in some ways, the sort of opaqueness of this notion of the Baroque is liberating as we can take 
from it what we want to use and compile our own sort of useful definitions. In terms of the time period, typically we think of the long 17th century as the Baroque era, that would, and then it kind of morphs into the Rococo in the 18th century. Um, now for our concept of Black Baroque, the temporal structure, the time period, we're really stretching it out to the long, long, very long Baroque, that would be 17th and 18th centuries. Um, so we're thinking of this entire uh, Baroque and Rococo or Barococo era as, as sort of fruitful for that artists kind of look back to in some ways. So to illustrate that, I've chosen, you know, the Versailles Hall of Mirrors as an example of the sumptuous drama of Baroque architecture and design. And it's a prime example of how material grandeur is a manifestation and a player in political and cultural power. In that room, we find painting and sculpture and decorative arts and a myriad of luxury materials, all working in tandem to depict the glory of Louis XIV. So this notion of material grandeur and the chandeliers uh, will continue to loom large in this concept of Black Baroque. And so another concept that's kind of interesting to me, and it's kind of wonky, but I thought I would mention it, is that Baroque art becomes important in the counter-reformation. So counter-reformation aesthetics, what does that mean? It means that um, the counter-reformation is a reaction to the Protestant Reformation. And there was a lot of iconoclasm during the Protestant Reformation. The Protestants felt that the church's imagery was too decadent, too sensuous, too relying on the body. And there was a whole issue about decadence in the church in general. So they're removing imagery, right? So they're removing these imagery. So the counter-reformation comes on and um, counters that or, or, or rubs up, it decides, it's, it doesn't decide, it's not a thing. But in in counter-reformation imagery, there's a, 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 an investment in the body. It's, it's a reaction to that kind of encodoclasm. So um, there's more enhanced drama. You're looking at the um, Rubens, Descent from the Cross. Um, it's almost like they're doubling down on the issues that were problematic in the Reformation. So you have um, sexu sensuality, you have drama, you have movement, uh, you have spectacle, you have churches that are just extraordinarily ornate in order to bring people back into the church. So I think that's kind of interesting, doubling down on the body when you think about, uh, I mean like kind of investment in the body, when you think about um, uh, contemporary, or you think about this notion of the contemporary artists and um, the back, uh, dealing with a body that has also been denied and decried and denounced and generated, sort of coming back and doubling down and in really investing in the spectacularity of it. It seems to kind of mirror that relationship. So perhaps the kind of Baroqueness is a remedy for denial. Um, and then another uh, important part of this, you know, this whole thing is style and power. And I love this uh, painting, uh, another Rubens, um, just with the extraordinary sumptuous uh, fashion. And sartorial splendor is really a great part of what we're thinking of in terms of Black Baroque. So what are some of the characteristics of um, what we're calling Black Baroque? And then I'm going to go through a few just you know, name a few ideas and then we'll go through and look at some of the artists who embody these ideas. Um, so there's a, there are direct references to Baroque art historical sources. There are over-determined or hyper-visible bodies, a notion of excess, uh, opulence and splendor as an arm of power. And all these things are overlapping, but um, I'm sort of trying to piece them out a little bit here. Uh, radical ornamentation, hybridity, transformation, luxury, religiosity or spirituality, theatricality, monstrous beauty, and new mythologies. So these are some of the ideas that seem to come up in this discussion that we're going to have today. And I've divided the material into two kind of distinct categories. First, artists that draw on the historical period. So they're quoting, they're riffing, they're interrogating the Baroque art and its political and cultural implications by engaging those pieces of art sort of directly. 
And the second is artists that call upon sort of the spirit of the Baroque, right? Um, they exhibit some Baroque sensibilities that we've identified and then other sensibilities that have morphed because of the particular issues around um, the history of blacks in the West that, that feeds into uh, this issue. Um, and of course, most artists have multiple sensibilities that they're dealing with um, and they overlap, but I'm, I'm pulling them out uh, and trying to look at them. So of course, if you can't really talk about this issue of, of art and art history and black figures uh, without referring to Kehinde Wiley, who's a, perhaps the best known um, black artist in the 21st century to draw upon art history in this kind of spectacular way. And I think that his work was generative and tre tremendously influential in this field and that others have taken it on and gone into some really creative directions. Um, so you're looking at his well-known colossal painting and size means something here, um, Sleep, that not only quotes, but is invested in the drama and the pathos and the sensuality of, of the Baroque. Interestingly, I found out, you know, don't do too much research because then, you know, you have to embarrass yourself. Sleep is, <laughs> is not based on this painting, <laughs> but we're going to pretend like it is. But it, no, it's based on an 18th century painting. And, um, but this is just how uh, this 18th century painting that it's based on is really based on these Baroque um, precedents for the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the death of Christ. And, um, and, and it's all sort of of a piece. And he's really joining in a, a centuries long conversation. But what is, um, so it's ultimately sort of linked to the source material, but he trace, he imbues it uh, by centering the, with something new by centering the black body um, with beauty, sensuality, and, and it kind of asserts the black male as a, an object of desire. So again, this is, the, this is the type of work where the Baroque becomes a source material that you're quoting directly. Um, so the art historical quote continued to be productive for artists like Yinka Shonabare in the 21st century. Uh, a British and Nigerian of, of Nigerian descent or Nigerian of British descent, whichever you want to call it, really comes, <laughs> he comes at this from inside and outside the tradition at the same time. Um, so here's an example of how Shodobari takes on um, the Baroque source, uh, Caravaggio's infamous Medusa, and engages it in a sort of multi-layered multimedia work that resonates with the historical source but takes on issues of concern to the artist. Uh, like we saw with Wiley, Shonabari is inserting the black body into a canonical art historical register with critical interventions like the use of Dutch fabrics that are sort of symbolic of colonialist entanglements. Um, I know it's also interesting that there's also kind of a performativity of, uh, behind this because um, you see that they, they create, the craftsmen create the, the Medusa snake head and then someone has to come in and put it on and perform for the camera even though what results is a still photograph. It's still a, uh, you know, there's a performance going on in order to even get that photograph. Um, but um, so in, here decorative arts with the Dutch fabrics become an important aspect of his critique of the legacy of colonialism. And in other areas like with um, Wiley, um, um, Kehinde Wiley, decorative arts, I don't know that the fabric that he paints is a critique as much as it's kind of an investment in that, the beauty of, the, of those things. So decorative arts, and you know, I'm doing this project on decorative arts. Um, they're never really as inert as you think. <laughs> There's always, some, there, there are political ramifications to that. Um, but Medusa North here is one of a series that includes Medusa South, Medusa East, and West. So it's almost like the four continents imagery that you see flourishing in the Baroque era. Um, he's, he's taking that north, south, east, west, like um, Europe, Asia, Africa, America. Those became the sort of boundaries in, uh, of, of the Baroque world and of, of, of the worldview of Europeans during this area of, era of expansion and colonialism. So he's referencing that. Um, now, what I don't know that he's referencing is something I'm getting ready to say. Um, I think 
I think of how a work like this reflects interest, intersecting mythologies of powerful women. So the monstrous Medusa of Greek mythology here. And I look at her and I see the powerful Mamiwata of West African and diasporan lore, both associated with snakes. So here Shonabari employs, employs the power and drama of the Baroque that becomes a vehicle through which we can explore myths of womanhood that converge and diverge through, through space. So, it, so this becomes a, a, a vehicle. Um, but the Baroque period is not just about spectacle and ornament and mythology. Um, it is an era that in the black Atlantic slave trade becomes a major force in Western history, right? The moment when economies built on enslavement of Africans become codified in Europe. So the enslavement of Africans in the New World is one of the major underpinnings of the wealth and power that create Baroque splendor in the first place. Um, so the work of Titus Kafar here takes on the power dynamic of the Baroque with direct quotations of art that implicates slavery and the dynamics of the Black Atlantic. Yet, like this, the portrait of um, Elihu, Yale, is, is that really the way you say it, Elihu? <laughs> yes. I've tried to figure that out. Elihu, Yale, you see this here. Um, Ultimately, this, this portrait sidelines the sort of harsh realities of slavery. So a lot of black artists have taken on this, black, this portrait, the, the attendance in European portraiture, as a way to try to resurrect the humanity of these anonymous figures. So this is another reason why the long Baroque is so attractive or compelling to, con to contemporary artists like Kafar who want to enter in history and to reshape it. Um, in Black Baroque artistry, history is not fixed. It's a space available for further exploration, for alternative interpretations, and new and even speculative realities. And the more you study history, the more you realize that it is, it is something that people like me <laughs> create uh, and put together. Um, and it's very hard to um, think of it as something that is, exists uh, um, fine, you know, in finite ways. So while Kafar took the slaveholders to task through creative reinterpretations of their own imagery, um, Firle Baez, for example, the Dominican-American uh, artist, invokes Baroque sensibilities. So this is when we're starting to get into what sensibilities of, of, of the Baroque um, that, that the contemporary artists um, are manifesting. Um, and she, as she contemplates the colonial past through transformed bodies, through the subversive power of beauty and through reimagined myths, the, the untitled map of the British Empire is awash with the tumultuous seas that literally swallow the Africans in the passage. But from it emerges a hybrid being made of fur, feathers and tropical vegetation. Uh, this is perhaps another iteration of her Siguapu figure, the Dominican mythological female creature or trickster seductress. She turns this watery graveyard into a site of power through the spectacular appearance of the mythological body. So out of even this archival reference, the archival of the map, she's transforming this. Um, uh, through and, and thinking of memories uh, of colonialism and, and trying and healing powers of beauty. Um, she continues um, with this conceptual portrait of the daughters of Henri Christophe, who was the first king of Haiti, who were exiled to Italy after his death and are the centerpiece of this ornate and melancholic work by Baez. Uh, this piece occupied the window of the Museum of Modern Art in, two th in 2018, which is interesting. Um, I don't know that, that we would have seen that there in, uh, in you know, 1998, um, even if it's just the style, you know. So they're, they're, we've come a long way recently. Um, the portraits are embedded in a decorative frames featuring lavish, scrolling ornamentation of Baroque and Rococo sensibilities. 
Amid the sumptuous designs, we find Haitian veve symbols. Yeah. Um, that are worked into and intersecting with the European style ornament. And in, in many ways, it's like the sort of syncretism of Haitian religious practices and cultural practice. And all of this imagery is fashioned on a wall that is peeling like an old colonial building that has been abandoned and de in decay. So she's calling up hidden histories and spirits that reside in this historic architecture. Um, and in fact, architecture is very important, I think, to her practice. In 2021, she created an installation called A Space Between Water and Sky that re references Henri Christophe Sans Souci, so we're back to Henri Christophe, um, the palace, his palace in Haiti that is now in ruin. And just as an aside, um, I went to visit uh, Sans Souci when I was 19 years old. Um, so in an installation like this, visitors can walk through an architectural environment um, that speaks to decay and loss and past grandeur and kind of see themselves and maybe feel through the, the uh, emotion uh, and the lighting and, and just being in a, in, in, in a side of a space like this. Imagine what it must have been like and all the contours of those uh, kinds of uh, situations. Um, now changing up gears a little bit, um, uh, American artist Simone Lee's Las Meninas takes a, its point of departure uh, with, as, with one of the most important and influential paintings of the Spanish Baroque, Velázquez's Las Meninas. It's also, Las Meninas is also one of the most written about and riffed on paintings in the history of art. So it's interesting, by naming this naming and claiming, naming this work Las Meninas, Lee is deliberately sort of wading into a very rich and highly charged territory and dialogue. Um, Lee's work is elegant and rather simplified in some ways compared to some of the other black Baroque artists, but works on multiple and multiple complex levels. She is known for her sculptural formations of the black female body. Monumentality and grandeur are part of her language. But by referencing this expansive panier, they call it the, that hoop skirt, um, uh, that the women of that era wore, wore, I see her sort of drawing on the power and extreme signification of courtly dress. But of course, it's not limited there. It doesn't end there. And this is one of the things that we have to think about when we're trying to put together an exhibition or even discuss and describe um, artists like this. Um, Lee's employment of the majesty of Baroque dress actually moves through quickly uh, the historical Baroque to center the lineage of black diasporic cultures here. The performative traditions like the Baganimba masquerade of Guinea um, or the Brazilian Condomble, these are infused in Lee's Mas Las Meninas, as well as even some African architecture that I didn't include. These lineages celebrate and ritualize female power, performance, dynamism, abundance, and spirituality. So an aspect of the Black Baroque is that it can be evocative, and evocative means toward representing the way traditions across the Black diaspora resonate with each other. So it's really important for us not to allow the European aspects of this to take up all the air in the room and not give space to the intersecting and uh, histories and concerns of the artists. That was one of my big concerns when I was doing this show, the exhibition Rifts and Relations, not to let the Picassos and Matisses um, overshadow uh, <laughs> the other work. Uh, so we were very careful to limit those, but it was really great to actually have them in the room. And you don't want to deny you, you want to strike a balance, uh, and it's really, it's, it's a very hard thing to do. Um, so another thread here is transformation and hybridity. I better slow down. I don't know. <laughs> um, transformation and hybridity are other characteristics that permeate black diasporic practice. 
and are essential, really, to this conception of the Black Baroque. There are many ways to characterize the hybrid bodies and new mythologies that artists like the brilliant Kenyan-American uh, Wangechi Mutu have created. I mean, Mutu's fantastical beings are awesome and fearsome, alien um, and familiar. Some would say that her work belongs squarely in the Afrofuturist or Afrofantastic camp. <laughs> but we can coexist <laughs> with these uh, alternate, uh, alternative ways of being in contemporary black diasporic practice. In other words, we can be, she can be black Baroque as well as Afro future. She can be past and present and future. Um, for Mutu and others, transformation is a strategy of decolonization and a process of creating sort of infinite possibilities. Now you see here on the left, um, outstretched is installed in the, the Young Museum uh, in San Francisco, um, and it's in the permanent collection. In that exhibition, the works were spread throughout the museum and all in conversation with the permanent collection. She had works outside. They have a big um, version of the, uh, Rodin's The Thinker, and she had some of her bronzes outside around that. So, uh, and in this room, this piece is directly in front of a very large Baroque uh, painting. Um, so I think that that is not by accident that they've ended up putting her in that room. Um, and in, in this creature, you know, it's very hard to describe <laughs> uh, what, what they are. And she's, her work is something that you have to see and experience and feel. Um, because naming is, is it, it, it's never, it's never going to end, right? Exactly. What, what do you call them? What kind of creatures are there? What do they mean? There's a kind of mystery to them, which is really fascinating and quite Baroque. Uh, <laughs> Fabiola Jean-Louis, uh, a Haitian American artist who has had a claim for her work in paper and photography in her rewriting history project, continues her journey now into the intersection of European and black diaspora history in this, which is her latest project. She's working on a large installation at the University of Central Arkansas called Waters of the Abyss, Intersections of Spirit and Freedom. So the works you are looking at are part of this installation. Um, and of course, she's certainly engaging the beauty and exquisite craftsmanship of European decorative arts and um, aristocratic fashion. The opulence and beauty and sub sumptuous surfaces of the work speak to you know, not only craftsmanship, but this material culture and the material culture of power, albeit in this kind of aged and melancholic images. Yet Jean-Louis project minds beauty to uncover the underbelly of European pageantry with respect to enslavement and de degradation of Africans. So again, we have this theme of uh, like that beauty, well, the insidiousness and almost trickster-like power of, of beauty um, to fool you and lull you into a sense of complacency when there's, there's always something or there might be something lurking inside. And of course, she engages racist, here, there's a black female face peeking out here, and you see the, the uh, large dress here, and this is a face here with half white and a half black, almost mask-like face. But these objects ha are made of, of paper and resin and gold plate and all kinds of different um, interesting uh, materials. Um, so these two would be part of a big, larger installation project that she's working on, and this one as well, and this is a little video um, because that she sent uh, t for us to enjoy, um, that sh takes you around the sculpture. Now this is a, a um, self-portrait of actually, and it's called Peregrine. And Peregrine is, um, it, it, it mean when referring to a person, it refers to a person as a foreigner or a traveler or a wanderer. Um, and here she's depicting herself as this traveler or wanderer, and I think, of course, into the past. And she's using these sumptuous materials. There's gold, there's glass, there's, let me see if I can say it right, um, pyrite, 
pyrite crystals. And on the back, you can see the, the, the crystals on the rock. And, uh, you know, you think of uh, her, I'm, I mean, I'm putting words in her mouth completely, um, but thinking about her, co uh, conceiving herself as a wanderer through history, through time. And she's depicting herself in this kind of decayed, as a decayed piece of sculpture. And what would it be like for a black woman to go through back in time uh, to this era that she keeps mining and trying to, you know, respect the beauty, respect the materials, but um, find uh, the other hidden truths. Um, South African artist, Atipatra Ruga, exemplifies not only opulence, but radical ornamentation. This is something that interests me a lot. Uh, when I think it's an important aspect of black Baroque aesthetics. Uh, now this bust was part of a project inspired by the Roads Must Fall movement in which students pushed for the removal of the statue of Cecil Rhodes in the University at Cape Town. Um, Ruga proposes an alternate monument that is a self-portrait of sorts drawing on a mythological figure in, from Kosa literature the mini-breasted one. So this is actually a self, kind of a self-portrait or um, a, a digitally, you know, created portrait uh, of, based on his body, and then there's three breasts there. Um, now the excessive ornament gives power and imagination to the body, um, and it's also an anti-colonialist statement. So for, and it's interesting to me to think of fighting sort of the brutal colonialist system with flowers and jewels and pearls. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a powerful message because, again, you know, like we talked about the, um, the counter-reformation, right, asserting the body as a tool to, to, to um, asserting the body and beauty a, as a tool to combat loss. But he's combating more than loss. He's, he's talking about the um, brutal political system um, through flowers and jewels and pearls. So there's something there that I clearly have not come to terms with, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> of course, there could be no discussion of radical ornamentation without Ebony Patterson, who's foundational to the Black Baroque phenomenon. And of course, I'm very nervous about talking about her when she's in the room. Uh, <laughs> So when I first saw the size, scope, and spectacularity of Patterson's work at the Museum of Art and Design in New York, the word sublime came to mind. Um, her unabashed investment in the language of abundance, ornament, beauty, and flowers, which I love, is truly astonishing. I'm intrigued by this more recent installation here that features a large white peacock made of white flowers and pearls and other materials. Um, and there's a pearl train, pearl um, tail slash train, that seems to be connected to the sort of lushly adorned and embellished tapestry on the wall. So these things seem to be connected, but we can ask her about it when we, you know, later on. Uh, <laughs> because I haven't seen it, and that's the, the, um, the other thing about, about working like this. You sh these kinds of objects, you have to see. Um, but at first glance, there is something sort of hypnotic about it. But when you look closely uh, or zoom in on the computer, <laughs> you will see the disturbing presence of disembodied black hands, right? So the cacophony of materials used by Patterson lures us into works that ultimately ask us to do the challenging work of considering black absence black trauma, the anonymity of black lives in the world that colonialism made. In the detail on the left, you will see the headless bodies that remain animated and almost re regal. Like these guys, they're, they're like hands on the hips and, t you know, but they don't have a head. Some of, and sometimes it looks like there's flowers coming out of there, but again, I want to let her tell us about that. <laughs> um, so this here, I feel like, um, and many others have said this about her work, radical presence, right, counters radical absence. Radical ornament obliterates 
radical erasure. And I think that's one of the main kind of themes we see coming through uh, this work. Now, I'm going to let um, him, Rush, Rashad Newsom, talk for himself. I know you feel that power. You don't know my plight. The allure of a king in the ring while I swing. You don't know my fights. Hell yeah, I got an ego. That's God in my ethos. No heroes, only he knows. Everything changed when he rose. Okay, it's gonna go again. But I will say that um, I don't know if anyone of, of you have seen the, uh, the show at the Baltimore Museum of Art called The Culture about hip hop and contemporary art. It's really, really well done. And so Rashad Newsom sort of overlaps, obviously, with all of these uh, things. And, and then his, <laughs> there's just the, the notion of bling, right, um, is taken to a di another level. But to me, there is a certain kind of Baroqueness. And there's another video that he's recently done where they're in a church singing almost like Gregorian chants. So um, uh, he's taking this on and, and bringing it into a, a, a contemporary kind of uh, um, aesthetic. Um, now, there are many different facets, right, of how um, Baroque is employed and deployed by artists. Um, now, here we see Micheline Thomas and David Antonio Cruz using Baroque aesthetics and dramatics to find a space for black alterity, in this case, queer identities. They both draw on traditional, the traditional composition of the Pieta, as the Virgin Mary laments the dead Christ. But, you know, we have to not only look at European art and all of its absences and illusions uh, of, of blackness and, 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 and its sources of wealth and material, not just look at that, but we need to look at how African American art and art history has developed in the 20th, in the 20th century. Um, and, and what has it left out, what left room for, right? We know that African-American art was invested early in the century, 20th century, invested in the culture of respectability, right? Um, discourses of black uplift. This was very important and it was necessary because it was attempting to, um, to, to counter these issues of stereotype and uh, you know, virulent and voracious imagery that was an arm of exploitation. Uh, so it was in, uh, there was kind of a conservative effort to assert and validate black people's humanity in mainstream American culture. I'm just talking about the general thing, um, ob observation. But it did not leave any room for queering black identity, right? Um, and I think that some aspects of black Baroque art open up possibilities for black alterity. Alterity is, you know, difference. Being different, being black and this, being black and that, being black and queer, particularly, was something that certainly was people's lives, but it was not necessarily the subject of the art. So um, what, what aspects of this idea, you know, are, are useful? Theatricality, ornaments, spectacle, the notion of fabulousness. Now, all of this stuff has been used in the queer community um, in popular culture uh, already. <laughs> but it's something that th in, in this, this whole new or this recent um, sort of phenomenon has uh, opened up for people like Micheline Thomas um, and, and excess and, and beauty um, and Antonio Cruz as well, David Cruz, um, to to have the freedom and be released from those kind of uh, issues of black respectability of we having to prove something. Um, so I'm going to, um, oh, we might have time for some questions, um, but I'm gonna leave you, my last part of this is gonna be an excerpt from my book, Ornamental Blackness. Um, I end the book uh, with a discussion of Fred Wilson's haunting black Murano chandelier. Um, that's why I wanted to start with the Versailles chandeliers. <laughs> um, and of course, it's in the collection here. One of them is in the collection here at the high there. It's an addition. I think there may be six, but there are others with different colors. 
um, patterns. But in the real case, so this is sort of coming out of the end, the very end, thank you, thank you, Lord, uh, of my book. <laughs> okay, in the rotunda of the American Pavilion at the 2003 Venice Biennale, hung a grand but ominous black chandelier by American conceptual artist Fred Wilson. Wilson, along with Venetian Murano glass artists, produced Speak of Me As I Am, Chandelier Mori, the first in a series of chandelier sculptures that would mine the vagaries of blackness in the West through the mournful tragedy of Othello, the seductive opulence, beauty, and innocuous power of the decorative. While in Venice, Wilson observed images and objects featuring African bodies that proliferated in the fine and decorative arts and were visible in the museums and galleries and shops throughout the city. Venice was home to Othello, the Moor of Venice, Shakespeare's beautiful and tragic character, whose story became a major part of the mythology of the city. Wilson revisits Othello, the Venetian tragedy enmeshed in race and betrayal, in an opulent chandelier, deploying Venetian luxury to represent the complexities of beauty, blackness, melancholy, and mourning. By applying highly saturated blackness to a traditionally white Venetian form, Wilson sought to create a funereal object that could be connected to the Othello story and more broadly to an essential blackness, communicating with his audience on an emotional, historical, and social political level. And just an aside, working with Fred, they, uh, Murano, this was the first time Murano ever did black glass. Uh, in, in a chandelier or anything like this. I mean, they had beads, trade beads that they trade the African slaves for, but that's another lecture. Uh, but this is the first time they ever did black chandeliers, and now they're doing them commercially. But anyway, for Wilson, blackness is a free-flowing signifier. Wilson found that glass was a beautiful, seductive, but ultimately meaningless material. His challenge was to inject meaning into the medium, and he chose to do that in large part through an unconventional use of the color black. He thought about what the color black means to different people in different places. He considered how, like hot glass, it molds and shapes and shifts. Along with the relationships to the character Othello, his intent was to fashion an abstract approach to the color black and what it means to be black in the diaspora. For me, the chandelier's monstrous melancholy goes hand in hand with its beauty. Although the design of this chandelier is based on one created during the Venetian Empire in the 18th century, it can be seen as a metaphor for contemporary conundrums of power and blackness. The monstrous, skeleton-like, multi-armed beings can't be separated from their traditional decorative beauty and the aspiration of power that luxury signifies. This unsettling combination forces us to consider the tension between beauty and monstrous blackness and to reflect on black histories lost over time and the complex and conflicted nature of contemporary black identity. Thank you. Ah. Hello. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Child. Hello? If you have a question, we have time for a couple. Dr. Charles, two questions. If I see a, uh, a scene such as uh, Margot Humphreys with the Christ, with, you know, she uses um, the imagery mm -hmm. of an a, a older a black male in the Madonna's arms, or yes. Curly Holton's, yes. you know, same Madonna, it, it, would that be, fit into your Baroque? And the second one is, I think it's Renee Cox, The Signing. How does that? Renee Cox is what? I, th I think she has a photograph called The Signing. Is that what it's called? Oh, Renee Cox. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking of and Renee Cox. It Stout. seems very much like what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. That's interesting. I, I know I would say yes to the Margot Humphrey. I would have to look at the sign, but that she, she does go, there's a couple people in there who re, kind of reference, they're referencing American history. There's, they're referencing like the signing of the Constitution, I think. Um, but I would definitely say yes to the Margot. I love that piece. Um, yeah. Anybody else have anything, any questions or comments? We have time for one what more. Did I? Okay. 
Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Thank Childs. You. Thank you very Such a much. Wonderful lecture.